Hello and welcome to the Joe's Art History Podcast, a podcast which celebrates all things art historical every single day. Welcome back and today I sit down with artist Hannah Lingyard to discuss one of art history's and indeed contemporary art history's most iconic figures. It is of course David Hockney. For those of you that may not know, David Hockney is an English painter, draftsman, printmaker, stage designer and photographer and is an important contributor to the pop art movement of the 1960s. And he's considered one of the most influential British artists of the 20th century and, as Hannah and I discuss, the 21st. Hockney has a love of colour and it's something that makes his paintings instantly recognisable. More important than that though, Hockney himself has a love of exploration of art in its entirety and in any shape and form he can find and work with. Most recently, however, Hockney has become known for using an iPad to make drawings. And this new embrace of technology wasn't warmly received to begin with within the art world. But as Hannah and I discuss, opinions have very quickly changed. Throughout this episode, Hannah and I discuss the importance of David Hockney, as well as keeping an open mind and why it's always important to try something new, because you never know how it will develop your art practice. Being an artist herself, Hannah is inspired by Hockney and his love of colour, and if you look at Hannah's work, it's very obvious of her love of colour, which she shares with Hockney, and I would definitely recommend that you check her out, and I'll leave links to her Instagram and her website in the show notes below. But before that, just sit back and relax as Hannah and I talk you through the wonderful world of David Hockney and his iPad drawings. Really, my my first question is, where did you come across David Hockney? Can you remember the first time that you that you saw his work or that you heard of him as an artist? Yeah, um, so my mum took me to um an exhibition when I was about 15 or 16 I think mm-hmm. and um you know before that I'd been to exhibitions at you know with, on a school trips and things like that um but I think I'd often found those experiences quite almost quite a self-conscious experience if that makes sense because I mean mm, no one yeah. really tells you how to do a gallery really <laughs> if that makes sense <laughs> um so, you know, I kind of felt pressure to look at every single thing in an exhibition, in which case that's exhausting. Or, you know, choose one thing that stood out to me and look at that for 10 or 15 minutes. But then I feel like everyone's looking at you like, why is she staring at that? Like, does she realise that's not going to change? Um, so, yeah, I think this exhibition that my mum took me to was the first time where I was just totally absorbed in all the artworks that, I just wasn't thinking about anyone else or what anyone else was doing. It was like I was just totally in this Hockney zone world that I'd never experienced before. Um, So, yeah, I just remember walking in and seeing this big, I I mean, huge painting. Um, I mean, I could read out the dimensions, but I find dimensions hard to visualise. But if you just imagine the whole of a back of a gallery wall, and the painting filling the entire space. I mean, it was just huge. (laughs) Um, And just, it was this amazing landscape of just like this woodland scene. Um, But the colours were just so vibrant. There were oranges, purples, yellows, greens, that, I don't know, I just almost immediately fell in love with this painting. And my immediate reaction was, I'd wish I'd done that. (laughs) <laughs> that's that's really good um so I think just from that point on I was just I had I'd never heard of Hockney before that but it was just like I've got a new favorite artist this is I'm loving this so mm, I think Hockney is someone that can really do that to you especially what you're saying there with sort of like the power and how sort of vibrant the colors are mm. I remember the first time I saw Hockney was actually it was during a university lecture and I was like Oh, it's quite an, and it's that, um, oh gosh, it's the one that he's really, really famous for, that Mr. and Mrs. uh, Percy Clark, but it's the couple that stand in front of these really sort of beautiful, that, well, they stand within this really beautiful apartment. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, okay, it's nice, I don't really get it. And then when I saw it in real life, I was like, 
which is because it's in Tate Britain I was like oh oh this is nice Mm -hmm. but he has this like love and sort of dedication to like exploring color but particularly just a vibrancy really in all his paintings but this the painting that you're talking about is called the arrival of spring Mm -hmm. and Colgate this is the one yeah yeah um and for me when you sent this to me when we were talking about um some of the works that we could talk about I couldn't work out if it was a painting or if it was an (laughs) iPad drawing I just because I was just like those colors are Mm. insane and it has this when I zoomed into the painting it has this this grid effect Mm -hmm. which I know Hockney really loves to work off of um and I was sort of like, right, I'm going to make a bet with myself. I think it's it's an iPad painting. And I don't think it is. is this, I think you're going to come in and tell me this is a painting, yes? Yeah, <laughs> I think that's the thing with Hockney stuff. Like, you just have to see it in person to fully grasp it almost. But obviously it's hard to come by. So images of what the best, you know, second best thing that we have. But yeah, it's 32 canvases all painted and put into this huge rectangular grid to make this one huge painting um and yeah I just I I don't know what paint he uses but it's just the the pigments are so pure and bright that you know when you go and walk up up to it it's just it totally surrounds your periphery vision everything and you're just like in this world of color um Mm, that's such a lovely way to put it it really is and it kind of almost like completely envelops you almost you and you you kind of have this thing where because it's essentially near enough life size I suppose like I found this really great after I had made the decision in my head I was like okay I'm gonna sit on the it's an iPad drawing sort of side of the fence and then I went to have a look at the David Hockney Foundation and there's a brilliant photo which I'll I'll put up online for people to see of him actually working on it in his studio Mm -hmm. And you can see he's like obviously created this wall that's that holds all these individual canvases specifically for this painting. And it's a really interesting thing to see him sort of working halfway through. But you can almost feel like when it's completed that you can step into it. It's so huge. Mm -hmm. And I think Hockney has this, I don't know, because it's not, I think it verges on realistic almost surrealist pop art it's a very sort of weird mix of all these things but it's it's the color that just is so vibrant and when you sent me these um the works that you wanted to talk about the theme within them is of course or the thing that's that makes them all sort of stand out together as hockney one his style but his like use and love of color Mm -hmm. and just the boldness you know like when you say pop art I totally get that because it's just these huge blocks of colour really and even though in this landscape in particular he has got a sense of perspective I guess with the you know these trees going into this like woodland landscape but the trees are just like you know a huge line of orange or purple you know they're not painted brown (laughs) um yeah so yeah I don't know it's kind of a mixture of like I guess graphic design which I I totally see why you thought it was an iPad drawing because it's like he's just filled in these blocks of shapes with paint Mm. somehow yeah and he's um he's just so interesting I mean I think maybe let's set the scene a wee bit for people that perhaps haven't heard of David Hockney Mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about him and, and who he is sort of historically within within art yeah um so David Hockney is still very much around. He's about 83, I think. And he's just had this incredible art career from, I think, as soon as he left art school in his 20s. You know, he's he's considered one of the most influential British artists of the 20th century. And I think you could argue 21st century as well. Um, I would agree. <laughs> and, yeah, I mean, the I don't know if it's exactly the same painting you were talking about before, but one of his um, paintings, Portrait of an Artist, uh, Paul with Two Figures, it's called, um, was sold at auction in 2018 for £70 million. <laughs> um, yep, just casual, casual pocket change, you know, really, for it. <laughs> yeah, he could, I'm sure he could buy some nice paints for that. So, yeah, which was, at the time, that was the most a piece had sold for, in terms of an actual living artist, because, you know, 
Mm-hmm. They say when you go into art, you only make money once you're dead. So <laughs> it's quite an achievement, really. Um, but I mean, he's experimented with everything you can imagine. I mean, if you put all his works together, they all look pretty different, to be honest. Um, he's tried abstraction. He's tried more observational works, photography, film, printmaking, collage, everything, really, he's had a go at. And he's just, you know, I just think he's great. I think it's amazing that you say there that he's tried everything and he really has, he really really has you know like you said painting drawing collage but he's also even now he's still making today mm. and he's still developing and he still has that sort of inquisitive nature mm-hmm. and sort of want of experiment and sort of try out the latest things that can help him as an artist and he's not very elitist in the sense where he's he has his thing and he'll stick to it there really is through time and you you can see his development as as an artist along with as new techniques appear shall we say he'll try them and sort of go with the times and I think that's incredible particularly for someone who as you said he's in his 80s and is still producing mass bodies of really important and incredible pieces Mm -hmm. um he really is a force to be reckoned with i would say definitely 100 percent. where he really started started coming up within the past sort of decade is his very much open embrace of using his iphone and his ipad to create art Mm -hmm. yeah i think the like the inquisitive nature you're talking about i think it's just what drives him as an artist so all this new technology that well I say new it's not very new anymore but it makes me feel old um you know he embraces all of it so he's he's done film work as well where he's put attached loads of cameras to a car and had these grids of screen showing the same area or picture but Mm -hmm. in slightly different angles um and yeah and he's used ipads and iphones for sketches and finished artworks as well which I think it's just interesting that as an artist you know if you can draw something on an iPad that's so easy to then send to your friends or family just on WhatsApp or whatever which I guess takes away that I don't know that traditional process of I guess famous artist art dealer gallery or whatever it's just kind of more instant and more accessible I guess. Well that's it and I I mean I mean, you you yourself are an art student, Hannah, so so you you know firsthand, like materials are incredibly expensive. Mm. And we're not saying here that an iPad's not an expensive piece of kit. Mm-hmm. Of course it is. It's one of these things that the initial investment and that you can keep going and going and going with it really. And all, all you need is perhaps an internet connection mm-hmm. and you know somewhere to charge it when your battery starts running low. And it really does open up the playing field a lot more and to sort of champion this as a way of creating because there's so many kids now that have grown up I mean I was I mean I'm in my 30s now and I grew I didn't have internet in the house until I was 15 16 mm-hmm. some of my sort of younger nieces and nephews they can't fathom that they say to us oh so in the olden days when you didn't have internet and I'm like it's not olden <laughs> days it was like 10 years ago <laughs> it wasn't a normal thing but it's it's so interesting that you know, that he's kind of uh, really sort of tipped his cap as someone who is one of Britain's greatest artists to say, yeah, I think this is a good enough medium and I'm going to go with it and and run with it. And it, he's some of the things he's created are absolutely incredible. And it just shows you that you can use these tools to create beautiful art. Definitely. And I think it's a whole new medium in itself, you know, with, you know, different mediums have their certain way of, working so if you use watercolor often you'll start with the lighter colors first and get darker um because you can't go over a dark color with a light color and so I think he's taken the tools that you get with an iPad drawing I mean I've had a go like once or twice and it's I find it really hard but it's because it's um totally new to me you know but he's really mastered it I think and you know he uses all the different brush textures that you can choose and um yeah I mean I, he's just a great artist so I think he can pick up any medium to be honest and just give it a good go yeah you sent me this really beautiful self-portrait actually of David Hockney mm-hmm. and it's him 
and it was painted 2012 is this is that round about yeah round about that 2012 and it's just him wearing this really lovely red shirt standing against a red background mm -hmm. and smoking a fag which if anyone has ever seen any interview of Hockney <laughs> it's like as well as a paintbrush the other hand always has a cigarette mm -hmm. in it and I think that's just been sort of part and parcel of the deal since he since he left art school yeah. what does this make you feel when, when you look at this I think I just I just love the idea that to me, he looks like he's in a dressing gown, like a purple dressing gown or maybe like a red pyjama top or something. I just love the idea of him waking up in the morning and just, you know, doing his routine, having a bag and then just doing a little, I don't know, self-portrait on an iPad really quickly and then creating this, I don't know, really detailed and I think pretty accurate drawing of himself. Um, mm. And just the the colors as you say which are just so vibrant I mean his eyes in particular this pretty vibrant blue which just stand out but you know he's used green or turquoise on his hair to kind of as the shading in the dark areas and then um I don't know it just feels quite simple and yet I don't know I think it says a lot about him as an artist and just how easy he finds drawing I think it just comes with ease for him I don't know yeah I I would completely agree with you. I just think his his skill in sort of colour manipulation and experimentation for me here is so beautiful. And to think that it was done on a sort of flat screen mm. and that he can just completely bring it to life. You get a real sense of his character in it for some reason. And it's just, yeah, I love it. Yeah. But what's really interesting is um, he got a lot of stick. Not everyone really liked the idea of using sort of the iPads and iPhones as a media. Yeah, I know. So um, in the landscape exhibition that I was talking about at the beginning, um, he had some iPad drawings there of some landscapes. And um, there was this one Guardian review at the time which said, um, this is a quote, <laughs> With their felt pen squiggles and eerily empty transitions so reminiscent of Photoshop, they appear inert and dehumanised. So I don't think they were much of a fan. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think, I don't know, I think it's interesting that they use the word dehumanised and just, I don't know, there seems to be this um, idea that with painting, especially if you can see the brush marks of the master at work, you know, then you have more of a sense of the artist present when you're looking at a painting um and to me it suggests that they're saying with the ipad drawings i guess because you don't i mean i guess it's more 2d in a way as it's like on a screen rather than jumping out of the screen with all the textures mm -hmm. and things but um you know he's chosen those different marks that that are available on the ipad for a reason and it's still his you know he's drawn those shapes and I still think you get a sense of Hockney in these drawings. So I don't know. I just thought it was an interesting comment. No, absolutely. And um, in sort of researching for this podcast, Hockney, this isn't the first time that sort of early, it says, you know, early 2009, 2010 is when Hockney started to experiment using um, sort of graphics and sort of iPad drawings or painting and drawing on screen. But that isn't the case, actually. So one of the earliest examples that I could find was from 1986. Oh, wow. Where he, and I'll, I'll send you the link. And for anyone listening, um, the link to this video will also be in the show notes below. So his first computer drawing was done actually for a BBC documentary in 1986. And he used something called the Quantel paint box graphic system. Now, if you can imagine any sort of 80s movie where you have some sort of like chunky computer screen, it was essentially this. And what Hockney did was he was given what was what looks like a light box or like a white bit of plastic and a pen, like a stylus pen. And he drew on this, this pad, which projected it onto the screen. Mm. And it was an experiment with the BBC to see... Um, essentially 
new ways of making art and developing and when he, it's really interesting so he's never done it before and in the interview he's like I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing here and then very quickly maybe about sort of 20 25 minutes into using it he's like oh it's really interesting because you learn how to layer colors and he starts using all these different sort of techniques and shading and then he starts talking you through what you can do like oh you can pick up this color and place it here things that you can do very easily to do on photoshop or i think the very sort of early inception of, of that idea was probably paint mm -hmm. for all those people who remember a life before everyone had a an apple laptop or a mac or whatever i've got to say i missed the paint and days you know i loved yeah. paint i used to oh my gosh I used to think you were so good oh, at it <laughs> and the, i can't remember what it was called but the like blurry brush thing that you can make multicolored. Oh, oh I loved it my favorite thing to do was when you took very sort of like Neil Buchanan art attack days mm -hmm. here when you took your pencil for a walk in paint and then you could um, with all the shapes that you've made put a different color in all the in all the shades and I loved doing that I loved paint but essentially this is what this uh, this graphic uh, sort of documentary was in the uh, 1980s but this um, sort of technique was developed late 70s early 80s for animation and for illustration and things like that so it's these techniques have always been around and it's not the first time that he's sort of toyed with the idea but I think it was because it was the first time he sort of openly and I think actually he was the first artist really to put an exhibition together that was partially or in, in its entirety work made up of iPhone and iPad drawings. Mm -hmm. Yeah I, that really struck me at this exhibition in 2012 that I went to of just I don't know, just seeing iPads in a gallery looked really strange to me um, and just felt, I think, more accessible, I guess. I mean, I don't have an iPad, but um, and it, that kind of technology we see all around us, whereas seeing these huge oil paintings, I mean, I've used oil paints once and it's incredibly messy and you need all the different mm. bits and bobs and it, you just need a lot of equipment. Whereas, I don't know, just a, seeing an artwork on a screen just made it seem like, oh, I could have a go at that well that's it and it's sort of championing the whole art for all and it was almost like you know this big artist giving his seal of approval to to making in this way and I think it's really really interesting how it was really resisted to begin with and I don't know but I think like any great artist you know you have to be sort of like forefront and really sort of believe in yourself and your ideas and really sort of push something forward regardless of what people say and he's kind of like the embodiment of like art for art's sake like it doesn't have to have this sort of big meaning or you know it doesn't have to like provoke this sort of awakening within you if it makes you feel good to make it then make yeah so I, I thought it was really interesting with the um that's what I really got from the exhibition with this landscape was just it was just great to look at I didn't have to get some deep metaphorical meaning or anything it's just like it was just a joy to watch, if that makes sense. Um, mm. But there was a review of that exhibition saying, just about the exhibition and, and as a whole, rather than just the iPad drawings, of saying, the results are bafflingly low on singularity, emotion or depth. They lend themselves dismayingly well to Royal Academy merchandise. But I don't know, I just kind of thought, so what? So what if it looks good on a tea towel? Like, well, that's it. And for, for people, and for a lot of people, myself included, you know, a tea towel is really, realistically, as close as you're going to be able to get to a hot yeah. cream. But what's really interesting is I was having a look on the sort of selling platforms, Artnet and Artsy. And the cheapest I found one of um, Hockney's drawings, one of his iPad drawings, which are editioned prints of 250. And the cheapest I found one of them for is 10,000 oh pounds. goodness. So... There's been a very quick turnaround. I know 10 years is a long time, but there's been a very, very quick turnaround in the sort of disgust. But then, like you said, it's that sort of accessibility thing. But, but if you think about one of Hockney's paintings, for example, like you said about the, the painting that sold for 70 million. And I remember when that was unveiled in, in Christie's in London and they sort of scrambled to get down to physically see it before it disappeared into someone's <laughs> collection forever. It was incredible. And... I think something like this, okay, yes, £10,000 is a lot of money, but realistically, it's a much lower entry point for the everyday person. Mm -hmm. I think everyone's got 10 grand. I'm not saying that <laughs> at all. But someone, an artist like Tracy Emin, for example, she has 
a company called Emin International, and they produce um, prints in a high edition number, so between 500 and 1,000, and she sells them for £50. And it's a way of these big contemporary names allowing, showing, you can have one of these pieces on my wall. It doesn't matter that some of my things are, you know, £10 million and some of my things are only worth 50 mm-hmm you can have these things and you can buy them. But more importantly, I think with what, what David is great at showing is that it doesn't, also doesn't matter what your age is, just give it a mm-hmm. go. Yeah, and I think, I don't, I don't really Which, know why there's this, um, you know, as trying to be an artist myself, there seems to be this, you know, two paths you can take of you can either go down this really commercial route which is kind of looked down upon in the art world, I guess, or you can go down this mm. kind of, I don't know, high art end where y- you may not sell very many works, but if you do, they'll cost quite a lot and they'll be in galleries and so on. Yeah, it's almost like there's an integrity to the latter route, Yeah, you know, the struggling artists. Yeah, whereas, you know, if you need to pay the bills, I don't, <laughs> I don't see what's wrong with doing artworks that are... You know, are sold for cheaper, but lots of people enjoy them. Well, that's it. And I think this is the problem with the art world, because if you go for the sort of high art, high prices, you are instantly narrowing your market to that 1%. And I think this is why people are so scared of like going into galleries. And like you, you made a brilliant point earlier, like you're not really explained how to air quotes here do a gallery you know how long you should spend looking at a painting or that you should look at everything because that isn't the case and like you said you can't physically look at everything because you get so exhausted why do you think there's so many cafes and museums okay yes it's a very good it's a very good money spinner but you do need to take time away and sort of think about what you've seen but also there's no right or wrong way to sort of move within a gallery space and it's that idea of I love that when you said you're so conscious of being in a gallery and sort of doing it right and people what people who work there perhaps are looking at you and being like what is she doing like why are you looking at that for ages but there is no right or wrong way to look at something I mean there are times where I've been in a museum for example I've got a, a great example when I went to Museum du Orsay in France for the first time and I saw this Degas pastel um, drawing and I nearly shoved a woman out of the way I just couldn't <laughs> wait to sort of stand in front of it and my sister was like, you've been here for 10 minutes. And I was like, just just go away, just go away. It's fine, come back and get me. And because I, I was just mm-hmm. loving it so much. And everywhere I looked, I saw something different. And for some people, they, they can make it sort of self-conscious that because my sister was like, people were looking at you. And I was like, <laughs> I don't care. They won't remember me when they leave. But I remember this painting so, mm-hmm. so well. But it's, it's a really interesting thing. I wonder also if it's because it, it's being made on an iPad people feel more comfortable at entering those spaces because it's something that they're they're a tool that they're familiar with themselves they might not be making on it mm-hmm. but it's something that they have in their home so it doesn't really feel so removed from them does that yeah, make sense? I think it's that familiarity and I think it's almost similar you know when you go to a science museum there's all these buttons and things you can press I think you're just almost drawn to a screen because we're surrounded by screens all the time um whereas not many of us if any have an oil painting in our house so yeah. <laughs> I don't know yeah it's just if you haven't grown up I don't know with art all around you it's hard to know how to yeah correctly respond to it um and you know until you just see something that you just love so much that you just don't care about what anyone else is doing right now you're just totally absorbed by what's in front of you that doesn't always happen in a gallery and I feel like sometimes if, especially if you've gone to a paid exhibition there's that pressure to enjoy it and love it and find something that you like so no I completely agree with you and especially and it's really difficult as well because these big paying exhibitions particularly if we're talking about somewhere like London mm-hmm. it's 18 pounds 20 pounds to get in and then if you don't if you're feeling intimidated anyway in these sorts of spaces because these are huge very powerful looking buildings so even for a lot of people the thought of stepping into them they're kind of like oh I don't really belong Mm -hmm. here and that's not the case at all and it just so happens that these places it's the center of the art world unfortunately you know they are in these very sort of big grandiose buildings because they were built to show Britain as this cultural powerhouse if you know at the time 
it was acceptable to have them in a hall with absolutely no sort of gilded decoration at all that's where you would be entering into unfortunately mm -hmm. that in order to sort of mark yourself as like a cultural empire set you know sort of I don't know trendsetter the, these buildings were these buildings in themselves were a statement to to other places across the world and they are when you when you go to somewhere like the National Gallery in Trafalgar Square and you stand in the square you think oh this is a pretty impressive building but I completely empathize with people that it's really intimidating to enter these spaces because you're not familiar with them but I think this is what I, I like about Hockney and and sort of using this medium this is a very sort of roundabout way of saying I enjoy these iPad drawings and the sort of accessibility that they can give people there was a point to this I'm sure there was <laughs> Hannah but I've gone off course I love a good tangent <laughs> a good tangent that I've completely sort of um sort of gone off with but it's funny because we we had kind of briefly discussed the whole the whole idea of sort of high art and um it's it's so interesting for me as someone who works in the art world I myself think when people use something like an iPad or there's a digital element people almost feel sort of cheated that their bohemian idea of like an artist in a really cold damp studio sort of like chiseling away or with like brush in hand standing at mm -hmm. an easel that that isn't the reality mm -hmm. I think yeah people like this idea of I don't know having like a modern day Michelangelo that's just gifted at birth and you know sculpting away and it's hard work and it's long hours and if you take away if you almost make that process easier is the artwork somehow worth less um I mean, I, I my dad showed me this really interesting article the other day that was about um, how artificial intelligence is being used um, to create images of people who don't actually exist. So there was this page of two photographs of two people, and one of them was a photograph of a real person, and the other one was this artificially created image of someone who doesn't actually exist. But the, it looked real, and it's just... The technology that we have now is insane. So I think it's going to be, if it's not a question already, it's going to be a question soon of, um, you know, how much human involvement do we need for an artwork to still count as art, essentially? Well, that's it. And then you have artists like um, Jeff Koons, for example. He made the papers a few years ago because he actually got rid of a lot of his um, he's got huge big factories, uh, well studios rather, he's got huge studios in New York and he got rid of a lot of his sort of studio hands because machines could mm. do the work quicker and potentially more accurate than what a person could and then you have this idea of so I work for a sculpture gallery that's paired with a bronze foundry and the bronze foundry has a 3D department so we have um, you know 3D printers where we can physically go and scan works and put them into a computer to then scale them up to print them and, and make them monumental. But even more interesting recently is they've bought equipment for virtual reality and we've had artists come in and essentially create work in, in the air using these virtual reality tools, which is then recorded onto a computer and then that is then printed and then from that print, it can be cast. And there's that issue of, um, this is an artist called Bruce Beasley that I've, I've seen this with, and he's an American artist who worked with um, Pangolin Editions Foundry. And I can send you the link if you want, because I think you're, you're um, I know you said that your, your dad and your brother work in sort of AI technology, which mm -hmm. is amazing. Um, and people felt cheated that, that, he, that his hand hadn't really technically touched his physical hand hadn't touched the work, but I would argue, I would argue it had because it was he had created the shapes and the form in space, which was then put onto a mm -hmm. computer. And it had anyone else, you or I, for example, attempted to do it, it would look completely different. Yeah, and and the technology that he's using isn't going to move itself. You know, you need that design almost behind it of, or the idea, you know, to even use a VR headset to create an artwork I mean that that blows my mind it sounds super cool um but mm. I think I think how I feel about it at the end of the day is just if the artwork 
that's the result of whatever process has happened really speaks to you and I don't know it's just interesting to look at does it does the process matter Mm. well that's it yeah well that is it and I think some people I don't know for me I think if you love something and again it comes back for art for art's sake it doesn't matter if it's a pile of rubbish that's been you know super glued together or it's an iPad drawing or it's something that's been created in virtual reality if it speaks to you in some way it, it doesn't really matter I would argue. Yeah, I mean, I think we just sold it there. So. <laughs> well, there we, where we are. Well, that's we're very accomplished for yeah. before midday <laughs> on a Wednesday, I must say. <laughs> um, so there was one more painting that you sent me, and this is a really interesting series, which because it's it's not part of an iPad no. series um, drawing, but it's um, he sort of returned to his sort of uh, additional uh, tra- traditional materials um, painting. So can you tell us a little bit about your your third work? Yeah, you'd so um, I guess this really um, goes back to his more traditional roots. You know, he was trained in drawing and painting. Um, so he created this series called 82 Portraits and One Still Life, um, which just amuses me as a title. I don't know why. I just like the idea that he was like, yeah, I'll paint a still life as well. Um, and he just painted 82 friends, really, or friends, children, people he knew, um, and he'd sit with them for two or three days depending on how much time they could give him and um he just painted them from life so they would just sit they are they're all sitting in the same chair and they're allowed to wear whatever they wanted to wear and he just paint them from life and they're almost I think they're just about life size so they're pretty big um and he's got this amazing blue background in all of them it's it slightly differs the shade or the tone yeah so this one I chose is of Barry Humphreys um who if you don't know is an actor comedian um who's probably best known for his character Dame Edna Everidge yeah it just this one really stood out for me I think just the way he's sitting he's kind of slumped back in his chair with one of his hands um his left hand kind of in a posture as if he's speaking or about to say something he's got these great red and white shoes on which just really stand out against the blue background and he's got a nice hat on I don't know I just liked his pose and the way he's kind of looking at Hockney while he's painting him yeah there's something quite cheeky about him actually and he's so charismatic even like the big sort of tie Mm -hmm. that he's wearing um yeah no I love this I think it's very sort of quintessentially Hockney but again he got completely slated for this exhibition in the Guardian perhaps the Guardian just (laughs) do not enjoy Hockney um but they said that they were essentially they had moved from realistic into abstraction and at one point in the article they were like there was just a dot of green on the end of someone's nose and they they just seemed so offended by this um but I think again it's his idea of like playing with color and also not using the traditional if you will air quotes again colors in sort of skin tone because sometimes your skin can look a little bit green or purple and blue and for them this just didn't sit very well with them but did you get to see this no, exhibition this is one, I haven't actually seen this in person but um I saw a documentary about um Hockney making this exhibition I can't remember when it was on maybe a couple of years ago but um I, I really wanted to re-watch it again for this but I couldn't find it um but yeah, the presenter is painted by Hockney in it as well. So it's just really interesting seeing his process and, um, you know, for having a few hours with people, I think to get, you know, I, I get what they mean about it's not totally realistic, but I think they're pretty accurate, you know. Um, and especially because I've experimented with portraiture and stuff and I use all kinds of wacky colours, so... Um, yeah, I don't know. I think I was just interested in Hockney's process and, again, his use of colour, which he's so good at. Yeah, because to draw a link back to your work, so when you wrote me and you said, oh, I would I would love to talk about Hockney, and obviously I went on and, and, and I follow you on Instagram, and I could 
instantly see sort of the the love of color and how that relates back to Hockney. And I think this one's really good actually because as a, as a, an example, because you have this really great way in your work to like block color, if that makes sense. Whereas like in the Barry Humphreys portrait, he has these really beautiful sort of turquoise and blues to sort of separate the floor and the background. And I can really see that in your work. Is that something um, Hockney esque that you've sort of taken with you into into your work? I guess I mean I've, I'm flattered that you see that, um, but <laughs> I think it all goes back to that like first exhibition where I kind of discovered Hockney and and was like, oh, I'd wish I'd created that. Like that's so good. Um, that I think that has just stayed with me ever since, and I've just the the joy that I get from looking at Hockney's paintings you know I've just tried to if I'm going to pursue being an artist you know I want to create work that gives people joy and just you know if they've had a really dull crap day that they can just look at something that's just really bright and colourful um and just to you know I think a lot of artists get a bit scared about using colour because it's so mm. I guess it can be sometimes looked down upon to use, you know, these bright fluorescent colours rather than more naturalistic colours sometimes. Um, but I think if you just, I don't know, just let all your inhibitions go and just really experiment with colour, I think it's a really exciting process. I would completely agree with you because I, al I almost think some artists that I've worked with in particular, they're almost too scared to be as invasive you know they, they don't want their work to be something that people feel that dominates the room but actually I sometimes think that's the best part about some of that's the best thing about colour it can just mm. completely lift you and it shouldn't be underestimated in all its abilities both in making you feel good and in, and in sort of improving the mood of a room but it, it can really say a lot about a person as well um, I mean I don't know about you but what always amazes me when I'm in London, particularly in winter, is that, or I would actually say in any sort of major city, is that everyone's outer coats, so their big winter coats, they're always like dark mm -hmm. colours, they're always like greens or blacks or greys. And when you put on a pop of colour, it can completely change your mood. And it also makes you completely stand out from a crowd as well. I, I am one of a love of very bold, bright colours, particularly shoes, <laughs> I like a bright shoe. Uh, and I just think colour is so important in sort of cheating you up and bringing you something that um, perhaps can really turn your day around, yeah, like you said. Yeah, I've just bought this bright orange raincoat and I love it because when it's like dull and grey and wet, it's just like, I'm here in my orange coat, you know, love and life. Love that. I love that idea of just like, I've got <laughs> visions of you going for a walk in the woods with like yellow wellies and your bright orange yeah, you coat on. Yeah, <laughs> love but uh, yeah. <laughs> I think people often see my artwork and they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> Get the colour link. Um, but you also use a very sort of air quotes again, non-traditional material in, in your yeah, pieces. Yeah, so this kind of came about kind of naturally, I guess, because um, I went to visit my parents when that was allowed in lockdown and um, left all my paints where I was living um and I'm currently stuck here so <laughs> I was like I still want to make work you know it's just a thing that I need to do all the time um so I just looked around the house and I just found these felt tips um that I've had you know since school probably um making revision notes and what have you um so yeah recently I've just really got into it and just been using felt tips and I guess like Hockney with his iPad drawings, trying to really work out how I can use this medium, like what are the strengths of it? What are the weaknesses of it? How do you, you know, I've learned that you can't really go over the colours, which I guess is why it's more blocky, as you say, because I'm sure any, I'm, I'm sure most people have used felt tips in your life, but if you've got a big block of yellow and you go over it with blue, it just looks green. Um, so yeah, I've just been really experimenting with that at the moment, which is fun. No, they're they're really, really beautiful. And like you're doing at the moment, you're doing like a, a call for sort of like selfies for um for your Instagram, which I'm really enjoying sort of uh, sort of seeing. I don't know, there's just something so joyful about them. And that's where I see 
the link with Hockney in your sort of use and sort of celebration of colour and not, like you say, shying away from, from using a material that's not traditionally considered within sort of the canon of art is something that uh, like, like an artist would use, or a, again, air quotes, a real <laughs> artist would use. Yeah, it's been funny seeing, I don't know, just different people's reaction to it. Um, but a lot of people got really behind it and it's been really great having, you know, I've had a few commissions of felt tip portraits and um, it's just been really fun using this like childhood medium, I guess, um, and just kind of trying to use them as an adult <laughs> yeah has it made you has it made you feel nostalgic you said it's this sort of childhood material and you're sort of like back at your sort of parents during lockdown do you f- are you feeling nostalgic do you think perhaps that's what what drew you yes to? I mean I hadn't really thought of it like that but I guess you know when you're in your childhood home a lot of <laughs> childhood memories come flooding back to you um yep coming from also yeah. currently with her mum and dad <laughs> Still adjusting to the uh uh yeah going back to that daughter parent relationship uh, yep teenager in your bedroom <laughs> sort of thing yep I, know, I can still feel the teenage <laughs> angst in here it's a bit painful oh. sometimes um oh, oh no so yeah I think it's it's nice just thinking I, and actually thinking about nostalgia I just I while I was here I was clearing out a cupboard because you know you've run out of things to do so I was like I'll, I'll clear out this cupboard that I've had for years um and I found this old sketchbook that I had um I don't know maybe when I was about eight or something and I wrote at the front Hannah Lingard an artist <laughs> and then you go through oh, it and I've got oh, all I these like that. I mean that I, I, I was gonna say terrible but I'm just judging them based on now but I think for an eight-year-old they're all right um but they're all these you know I was obsessed with the little mermaid so there's all these like mermaid drawings and you know um so I think I've always had that love for drawing. It's just something I love to do in my free time. Um, so, yeah, I think it's thinking about eight-year-old me and my abilities then, which, you know, for an eight-year-old were all right. <laughs> um, and just, I just like the idea of little eight-year-old me looking at me now and being like, that's really cool what you're doing with felt tips. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it is really cool what you're doing with felt tips, though. It's it's so interesting. Um, I'm going to swing it back round to Hockney for for one last um yeah, do it. for one last time. Now we've talked we've talked about sort of the idea of um Hockney mm-hmm. using his iPad for creating um uh, all these incredible sort of paint at portraiture and sort of still life work and which have essentially have become prints in themselves, but how and, and we said that he obviously he uses a lot of different sort of materials and the most recent of which where he sort of merged you know the iPad with a different design was in 2018 when he designed this is news to me a stained glass window for Westminster yes Westminster how cool Abbey. is that I was I remember this happening at the time and just being like you know you've made it when the Queen's like can you design me a stained glass window and it's and it is this complete celebration of color and love of color in this window. It's such an amazing thing, and to think that he designed it on an iPad. And I've got a great quote from he just he just said um, the natural choice was of course an <laughs> iPad because um, it's backlit like a window. See, he's just so clever. He's just amazing. And considering, I think that was unveiled when he was like yeah. eighty one. Like you said, he's now eighty three or something like that. You know, so he's. He's fairly getting on a bit, but I think that's a classic artist, though. You don't ever retire. Kind of like what you're saying there. You know, you're looking at your sketchbooks from, from when you're eight and that you're back at your mum and dad's and, and you just kind of, you have to make. It's just, there's no explanation. You have to do it. And I think that's with any artist, you don't ever retire. And you just, because it's part of you and you, and you love to make and you just, you just have to. And I think Hockney is the embodiment of, yeah, of that, really. totally. You know, he's, it's just so him that that's why he's you know I think as a individual you try different things you have new experiences and I think you totally see that in his whole work spanning how many years it's been um and I think the fact that he's still making work now you know most people are retired in their 80s um but he's just being himself which is just totally an artist and just um 
still drawing, making stained glass windows. You know, I don't think he'll ever stop. Yeah, well, that's it. And look, look, going back very quickly to what you said there, he is a total character, though. He is, he is such a lad, and he's just, yeah, he's really funny, and and just very, very much himself, very and very unapologetically so, as we all should be. Yeah, he doesn't come across as this really like, I don't know, <laughs> posh high end artist you know he's just authentically him he's got a great Yorkshire accent which is just great to listen to um so yeah Mm. he's just really relatable I think I completely agree Hannah thank you so so much for coming on and speaking to me about Hockney it's a really interesting conversation and really interesting for me as an art historian as well to sort of look at the developments and sort of digital technology and how it's been used and sort of celebrated or complained about within within art and um, so before you go I do have one last question and it's the Joe's Art History podcast so it's the final question that I'm trying to remember to ask everybody but I'm so far I'm about 50 <laughs> 50 with it and you can take this as um wide or as sort of narrow to you as you as you possibly want and it's quite a big question and that is why is art important that is quite a big question. Um, <laughs> I think it's it's a great question and it's one I've had to actually really grapple with as an artist myself, um, especially because um, back in the first UK lockdown back in March, I was in a household with two um, brilliant NHS doctors. Um, so they were going out every day and literally saving people's lives <laughs> and being amazing. And when I spent the whole day at home drawing or painting, I was kind of like, is this important? Like, really, is what I'm doing, does this really matter? Um, But those people in my life who were doctors, work for the NHS, were actually really encouraging to me, saying that, you know, we don't want to come home from a really hard day at the hospital to this, like, empty, dull house, you know, to come back to some kind of, art in the space actually gives us life and something to look forward to um and I think if you broaden the definition of art to include everything you know tv film books music it's it's what we all enjoy doing in our free time you know watching Netflix or going to the cinema when that when we can do that again um so basically to answer your question in a sentence I think art's important because I just think life without it would be really dull yeah, I completely agree with you, Hannah. You answered that so beautifully. Thank you so, so, so much. Can I just say it's been great speaking to another human that's not in my household. <laughs> Hannah, the same. Thank you so much for not being my mum or my dad. <laughs> you are welcome. <laughs> no offence to either of them. <laughs> um, okay, Hannah, before we go, or um, where can people find you and what you're up to and see some of your amazing art? Um, so you can find me on my website which is hannahlingard.squarespace.com or I'm on Instagram as well which is just my name at Hannah Lingard. Amazing and I will leave links to both of those things in the show notes below. Hannah it's been an absolute pleasure and um, from a very miserable grey day in Scotland it has been fabulous to spend my morning um, sort of looking into Hockney and talking about his love of colour and exploration with you so thank you so so much yeah it's been great to talk about some colourful artworks in this dull weather we're having yeah dull dull weather slash dull year of covid (laughs) (laughs) thank you so so much have a really good day bye bye there you have it the end of another episode of the joe's art history podcast once again thanks to hannah for coming on and speaking so brilliantly about david hockney his ipad drawings and also the importance of art embracing new technology i think it was a really great chat and it's got me thinking about loads of different things so thank you so much hannah if you've enjoyed the podcast please make sure to like rate and subscribe and if you are able to it would be brilliant if you could leave a review which not only means a lot to me but also it lets other people find the podcast as well speaking of helping other people find the podcast while you are listening if you thought of anyone that would benefit from listening please feel free to pass on the podcast to them it would be great to get more people listening 
As always, any images discussed during the podcast will be available to view on my website, which is www.joesarthistory.com or via my Instagram page, which is at joesarthistory. And links to Hannah's website and social media channels will be in the show notes below, as well as some further resources if you are interested at all in digging a little bit deeper into David Hockney and his wonderful world of iPad drawings. If you'd like to get in touch and discuss anything that you heard on the podcast today, please feel free to do so. You can email me, joesarthistory at gmail.com or you can contact me via Instagram at Joe's Art History. My DMs are always open. This podcast can also be viewed via YouTube where you'll be able to listen along and read with subtitles. Finally, I've been Joe McLaughlin, your host and resident art historian, and thank you so much for listening to the Joe's Art History podcast. I look forward to welcoming you next time. Until then, keep learning and remember, art is for all. Bye.